with the program and take a look at the scholars studio, Chinese scholars studio. It was a place where uh, educated people would, would escape to, usually in their compound to get away from everyday routines and the hustle of the city. And it was a place where people went to to create works of art. This could be calligraphy, painting, prose, poetry. And you see this in uh, many of the gardens. There'll be a special place, location for a scholar to retreat to. Now, in a traditional scholar studio, there are always four treasures which are found. Those four treasures are brushes, ink stones, ink, and paper. And with those, the artist could do his calligraphy or paint uh, or what, whatever, creating uh, beautiful works of art in various forms. Now, in the, take a look in this studio. Okay, with that, we'll welcome people to the humble scholar studio, Ken Tay, uh, here in Southern California. And Ken, what are we looking at here? Okay, this is uh, part of my studio. I have my pair of uh, mean armchair, and between the armchairs uh, is, is a little table. And then usually we'll hang a painting uh, right behind the table. And the painting I have here is a, an old piece from Japan. And I like the color, the combination of the mounting and uh, very traditional. Do you see two little things hanging on the top there? Um, in, China, in China, they don't do that anymore. It's kind of like uh, disappear in the Chinese culture, but the Japanese still keep that and um, actually the reason that they have those, those two things is because in the old days the Chinese uh, ceiling is very tall and they want uh, sometimes when they hang a big painting the swallow will come and stand on top of the painting and they would you know pull, <laughs> make the painting dirty so <clears throat> have that you can use a fan or the wind will blow in to the front door and those those two things in Chinese is called jing yan yan is a swallow uh, jing means to scare it means use that to scare off the swallow so uh, <laughs> and it's an artist yeah I like this so I hang this uh, with my furniture and okay uh, Usually in the hall, there'll be like probably uh, four sets. So it'll be eight chairs, eight or 10, usually even number. And um, the, the host or the master of the house will sit facing the front door and then the guests will sit on either the left side or the right side. Okay, now let me just introduce Ken. Ken was born in Malaysia, educated in UK, Taiwan, and USA. And 
He studied art in Taiwan. He has uh, two degrees, a master's degree, and he has learned his art skills, basic art skills from his father, and then we'll learn later who else he, he studied with. But his paintings have been exhibited in China, Japan, Taiwan, Malaysia, in the US. He's had a solo exhibition in San Marino, California. And he is the president of the Chinese Calligraphy and Painting Society here in Southern California. So Ken is truly uh, a scholar when it comes to uh, Chinese culture and Chinese painting. Now we'll take a look at Ken's four treasures. Ken's you got on the left, dozens and dozens of brushes <laughs> and on the right, they're hanging. What, what, what's going on here? Why? why <laughs> Tell us about this. Okay. Um, one time I did a talk with the alumni of uh, Stanford and it was a program for the alumni and the family. And a little girl saw this picture and said, how many brushes do you have? And I said, I'll count it after the program. I uh, let you guys know. And I counted it. I have 232 brushes all together. And on the right, you see, uh, I hang the brushes on the stand. And on the left, you see them all kind of like uh, putting in containers, which is the opposite direction. The brushes are uh, like facing the sky, pointed upwards. Uh, for brushes, we I the reason I have so many is because I do uh, mostly painting and I also do calligraphy and different kinds of hair would produce a different kinds of brush stroke and uh, usually if I want to do a big painting, I need the very bold and big brush stroke. I would use the big brush stroke, uh, big brushes. And if I do a real fine line, I would use the a real small brush. And for the brushes, um, you can see it's made uh, by bamboo. You can see all different kinds of bamboo, different colors. And then um, the hair uh, usually is from animals and they use all kinds, many kinds of animals, rabbits, goats, uh, the Chinese call wolf, actually they are not hair from wolf, it's from the weasels. And they also even use, uh, according to the writing, uh, the famous calligrapher Wang Xizhi, uh, he wrote the, the poem of the Orchid Pavilion. And according to the recording, he uses, uh, he used the brush that was made by the whiskers of the rats. I said, how could they collect whiskers from the rats? But that is how it was recorded down. And um, most brushes that I have, they are hairs from goats, uh, rabbits, and whistles. Okay, let's go on, move ahead and look at your second treasure, ink stones. All right, as you can see here, I have on the left, I have a rectangular one and then a round one uh, below the rectangular one with the lid on. And then right by the side, I have three, three more round one. And on the very, on the very far right, um, I have a kind of off, almost oval shape. And that's the one I inherited from my family. And, um, the one on the very left, the big rectangular one, it measures about one foot long and the width is like about eight or nine inches. So because in the painting, I didn't put anything for comparison, but the real inkstone is really big. Well, and let's take a closer look at it. Here. All right. Yeah, now you can yeah, see the yeah. compare the ink stone with my hands. <laughs> this is for like writing. 
because mm -hmm. for writing you don't need that much ink. Mm -hmm. But when you, uh, it depends. If you want to use less ink, you use this side. If you need more ink, you use this side. So for painting, you use this side. Uh, depends on what kind of painting. Like mm. if you do the the real expression with big brush strokes, you want to use this side. And then uh, the most interesting part is the inscription here on both sides. And it dated the date I checked is 1830. 1830? Yeah. Wow. What material is, is it made of? Stone. I don't know. Yeah. Because of one of the official during the Qianlong period, I think he uses this this uh, stone. I wonder what type of stone this is. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Phoenix. Now we'll find a third treasure, ink. And we've got an ink stick on the left and liquid bottled ink on the right. And what's going on? Okay, in the past, we always use ink stick. And the way to use the ink stick is you pour water on, on the ink stone and then you hold the ink stick uh, right up and then you hold it with your five fingers and then you kind of just rub it, move it around and around. You rub it on the stone to, and you, um, to create the ink. And usually, um, the tradition is while you are making your ink, you kind of calm yourself down and you're thinking of uh, your planning, you're making plans on whatever you want to write or you want to draw. And nowadays, I think because of is a fast food culture affects the Chinese culture too. So nobody has time to make the ink. So most artists now use uh, this kind of uh, ink ready making in the bottle. You just pour it out and then you can, it's ready to, to, to be used. Okay. There are different brands too. Yeah, I'm not doing any advertisement, but just showing <laughs> one of them. <laughs> yeah. Now paper, do you use different types of paper or, or what and what kind of paper? Okay, um, it's a paper that especially make uh, for painting and, and choreography or writing. And nowadays, uh, the translation go back to original word, Xuan, Xuan paper. When I first came to US, I look at many books, they put down rice paper. And I was wondering, I don't know who translated the word rice paper into, I mean, the paper into rice paper. I figure maybe someone who did the translation thought that, well, Chinese eat, eat rice, so <laughs> just call the paper rice paper. Actually, um, the paper is made from wood pops and fibers from the tree trunks, uh, different kinds of fibers. And then um, there are two main kinds of paper. Uh, according to the Chinese artists, they call it the the raw paper and the cooked paper. Well, they use the word raw means nothing is added on. That means no chemical, it's just uh, the wood part and how they put it on the bamboo screen and they peel out the paper and dry it. And for the cooked paper, uh, that is for the painting like this because that kind of paper when, when once your brush touches the paper, um, the paper would absorb the, the ink. And then if you are not careful, the ink was pressed and you know, make uh, the ink kind of like flow all over. And for the cooked paper, they apply a layer of chemical, the, called, the chemical is the alum, A-L-U-M. They use that, mix that with water and they would brush it on the, apply it on the paper and the ink won't run so fast on the paper. And the, the Chinese scholar call it the cook paper. And for this painting that you see, that is the cook paper. 
because I draw the real fine, uh, real fine line, and then I fill it up with uh, a lot of color within the boundary. Okay. Now, another thing that's not one of the four treasures, but it's something that's essential for most paintings, your seal or chops. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, these seals uh, usually make from, 99% of them are made from stone. And most of them are like different kinds of soapstone because it's soft, it's easier to carve. And sometimes people may use uh, wood or use uh, an ox horn or in the old days, even ivory. But I would say 99% are soapstones. Mm -hmm. And the picture that you see on the left is the kind of the wax that we use. And I don't know the recipe because uh, they never disclose the recipe. And it's kind of you, you, you stem the steel to get the, the, the wax and then you press it onto your finished work after you sign your name. Well, let's take a look at some of your seals. Here are two boxes full. Okay. And you see so many because uh, I like uh, different sizes of seal to accomplish my sizes of my painting. For a big painting, I would big a big seal. And this is a set that was given to me by my father uh, when I was in my early 20s. And you can see there are so many different sizes. This is a whole set. And my father ordered it and then also ordered the box. And it was given to me as my birthday gift. What a precious gift. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Now, let's, let's take a look at some of Ken's works now. And one of the mediums he works on are fans. So Ken, tell us about this, this fan. Okay, uh, before the program started, I said I dig out uh, some fans. Okay, actually the, the fan that you see here is um, not the first version of the Chinese fan. The very first version is, um, is a round fan. Okay, let me, let me see, I can show it on my screen, I mean on, okay, I can see my own. <laughs> well, that's all right, let's move on. Oh, okay, yeah, so uh, what you see here is um, not the first version, the very first version is a, is a round fan. And this one is based on the idea of a peach, a fruit. So you can see the top is kind of like pointed and the other part is kind of round. And I bought this in uh, Guangzhou and I, it was white on one side and the other side there's uh, some gold leaf pattern on it. And I just painted a flower and a, and a grasshopper on it. Okay, and here's another one of your works, another fan, different style fan. Okay, this is a folding fan. And um, folding fan were actually was, it was not invented in China. It was invented either in Japan or Korea. Different scholars has different theories. And um, the, the folding fan became very popular uh, until like Ming Dynasty, that is uh, around 1402. The reason why it got uh, popular during uh, the very early 1400s, because of uh, Ming Dynasty was founded in uh, 1368. And then, um, the first Ming emperor died and he passed his throne to his elder grandson. 
and um, the elder grandson at that time was a, a teen, young teenager. And the uncle of this emperor kind of like uh, didn't feel happy about this because he thought I'm so capable and why um, my father passed the throne to my nephew and not to me uh, because just because he was the eldest son of the first son and the uncle was the fourth son. His name is Zhu Di. Uh, last name is Zhu, according to the pinyin Z-H-U. And then his name, his given name is Di, D-I, Zhu Di. Uh, Zhu Di was known in the history as um, Yong Le Emperor, Emperor Yong Le. Uh, Yong Le means forever happy. Uh, he was born in May 2nd, 1368 in today's Nanjing. And he was the fourth son of the first Ming emperor. And um, he kind of like steal the throne from the nephew. Uh, he, he moved his soldier from Beijing to Nanjing because uh, in uh, uh, 13, 1368, the, Ming, the first Ming emperor set the capital in Nanjing, not uh, today's Beijing. And Beijing became the capital uh, from 1402 until 1911. So it was like 500 years as a capital city of China. So this emperor Yongle, uh, when he got the throne in 1402, and he was on the throne for 22 years. He was the emperor, the third emperor of the Ming dynasty. Uh, so he was on throne from 1402 to 1424. And when he was on throne, one, one time, the Korean ambassador sent him many, many uh, folding fans. They are all white fans. And he looked at them and he kind of like it and he's passed the fan to his uh, art academy and he ordered his court artist to paint on the fan and then he gave the fans to the high rank officials and because of it was something given by the emperor so you have to use it and this the high rank official they were using it uh, especially in the summer and then because of uh, the high rank official like it, the emperor likes it. So it became, just became popular among the scholars. Mm. And on this fan, at first I just, I painted the plum blossom. And when I finished, I look at it and I felt that the left side was too empty. So I just took up my brush and I added two bamboos. And you can tell the bamboo is in a lighter color. I don't use the pure ink. I mix uh, ink with a lot, a lot of water uh, to create the, uh, to make it look like the bamboos are far behind. They are mm -hmm. not in the same space. Okay, well, let's take a look at how you actually make one of these uh, painted fans. Okay, when I bought the fan, it always come like this, two pieces. And you can see the, the paper part and the bamboo part. We call the bamboo the bones. So you have to stretch out, stretch out the white part, the, the actual fan. And you can either have something to like, nowadays many people use thumbtacks and on a piece of wood, and then you stretch it real flat because if it's so jagged, it's very hard to, do the brush strokes and when you finish painting you sign you put the seals and then you started to put the bamboos the the bone inside the fan and then you only glue the two sides not the middle mm. how it was made okay now let's take a look at these two styles the okay <laughs> yeah so on the Right is a blue and green landscape on a folding fan, like what I said earlier. 
uh, I had to paint the, paint the fan first and then put the bamboo. I think there were like 14 or 16 in the middle. And then I just glued the two sides. And then the one on the left is a fan made in Japan. It's white on both sides. And I just uh, painted Mifu, the scholar of Sung Dynasty who loved rocks and stones so much. And the story says that one day he, uh, when he went to his office and when he first got there, he saw this, this uh, Taihu rock and he said, oh, this is my big brother. So every day he would dress in his proper uh, uh, outfit, the outfit that he's supposed to wear for office. And then he would bow to the rock. Mifu bowing to the rock. Okay. Yeah, Mifu's the story of Mifu and his paying tribute to the stone is well known. So basically, this, the rigid fan on the left originated in China, and the folding fan originated in either Korea or Japan. Now, let's go ahead and look at some of your calligraphy, piece of your calligraphy. And I understand this piece is currently in uh, Taipei. In Taiwan. Yes, in Taiwan. Taiwan. Mm -hmm. That's going to be on exhibit soon. Yes, it's going to be exhibit. Um, and this one is not mounted yet. That's why you can see the folded line because I have to send it uh, to Taipei like that. And then uh, it got mounted over there and then it will be shown during Chinese New Year. And uh, the writing there is a poem from Tang Dynasty, a very famous poet called Wang Wei. And this is about sitting in the bamboo grove and his, and then he was telling about himself that he's sitting in the bamboo grove and I play my qing, the musical instrument. I kind of yell out loud and in the deep forest, nobody knows about me, only the moon come and shine on me. That's what this poem is about. Okay, well, let's take a, I look at another piece of your calligraphy, slightly different. Okay, this one is uh, slightly different, and uh, the calligraphy in the, is uh, in the style of the Han Dynasty. The the characters is called the critical script, not the standard script, and it's also a poem from the Tang Dynasty, a, a poem from Li Po. And this talks about um, youngsters in the capital city, Chang'an. And it says that uh, the youngsters uh, buying his uh, saddles from the east side of the city and then buy uh, the other, the, the other uh, like the whips from the other side of the city. And then I write, I, I rode my horse uh, wandering around the city and look at the flowing blossoms. And then when the blossoms are all gone, it was all fallen down. I was laughing. I just went into a bar operated by a foreign lady. Because of uh, during the Tang Dynasty, there were many foreigners that came to Chang'an, today's Xi'an. And but this fan, you can see the silver gold leaves on it. And for a folded fan, usually uh, one side is just plain white and one side is either have gold leaves or silver leaves. Like this one, you can see the silver leaves. And for the one, the one with the gold leaves or silver leaf, you want to do just calligraphy. And for the plain white, you paint on it. Okay, it's very interesting. Now, Ken, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you about what the style of the painting that you follow and who were your teachers. And we have a little video to show our uh, audience and we'll do that and then you can add to that. Uh, I wouldn't say I have developed my own style. <laughs> it's so hard. Who, what style do you, do you follow? Uh, I follow the style mainly uh, Zhang Daqian, and then I also follow the style of the 
uh, the Song Dynasty painter. Yeah. And if you had to, if you had the opportunity to sit down mm -hmm. with any Chinese painter, mm -hmm. living or dead, mm -hmm. who would that be that you would have to have to talk to about painting and art? I I would say the one that I admire the most, Zhang Da Qian, because I met him when I was uh, twelve years old, and since then he influenced. Actually, I wanted to learn from him, but he was asking my grandfather, could I go to Brazil with him? Mm -hmm. And my grandfather said no, <laughs> because they don't want me to become a yeah. professional painter. So when I was in Taiwan, I learned under his main student, his, uh, a very outstanding student of him. So you were, uh, y your grandfather and your father painted, mm -hmm. and you learned a lot of your painting skills from them? Um, not really a lot, but the so foundation, basic. the basic, yes. Mm. Okay, are you getting this? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, we're going to take a look at some of Ken's paintings that he's done, and he's going to comment about each one. And Ken, I'm going to let you start with this uh, first black and white one, and you can okay. explain to our audience what we're what we're seeing. Okay, but this one is the you can see the brushstroke is kind of bold and very vivid. Okay. Um, we call this uh, freestyle in Chinese. It's called the xie yi style. Xie yi means like express your expression. Um, you can see from the dragonfly. Uh, for the wing, I just use one stroke. I press it and then I kind of leave out my brush uh, lighter. So I, and then I drag the brushes, my brush on to create the wing. And the flower, I just make a kind of like brief outline for the petals. It's not really meticulous. And then for the leaves and the grass uh, right next to this flower, um, I just kind of like press the brush on the paper real quick. And for this style, you need a lot of practice because you have to be very, very accurate. And you have to know where to press the brush. You need to plan ahead of time. And once you kind of know what you want to do, for, like for this one, it took me about 15 to 20 minutes to finish the whole painting. But it takes years of experience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's true. So this is a freestyle. Yes. And this one is also the freestyle? Yes, this is also the freestyle. That's why you see only like this one, I can do it in five minutes. <laughs> Um, and you can see earlier we talked about the seals. Look at how small the seal is. I don't want the seal to overpower the painting. That's why I have different sizes of seals. And this is a, another example of a freestyle. You can see I just do the bamboo leaves with like each stroke, each leaf is one stroke, one stroke real quick. So this is another example of the freestyle. Mm -hmm. Ken, when you talk, tell us the different basic difference between Chinese paintings, because I believe they, they they express feelings, whereas a lot of Western paintings try to reproduce exactly what they're seeing. More yes. is this is this the case or what? Yes, because of um, after the Song Dynasty, uh, before the Song Dynasty, most of the Chinese painters were professional artists. They are not scholars. But then during the Song Dynasty, the many, many scholars uh, kind of get involved in the painting and they kind of like took over. And for the scholars idea is like, I want to just express my inner self. So um, um, if I would say in one word, I would say Chinese brush painting is uh, idealistic. It's just to express your idea, what you feel about nature. And for Western painting, I would say it's realistic because you, you want to capture the 
the real object, you even put in the light and the shadow. But in Chinese painting, you never, never see any shadows like this one. And also it's very much uh, influenced by the Taoist uh, philosophy. Like you can see in this painting, um, there's a, a small mountain or rocky mountain on the left hand side with a tree and then a small bridge. And then you can see a scholar in a boat. And I don't uh, depict any waves or anything. I just left it empty. And this is the essence of a Taoist of a philosophy. Whatever is empty is solid. So even though I don't paint anything, I don't depict any waves or any brushwork, but all the Chinese look at it and say, oh, this is mountain and then the water. So Ken, the, the, the large rock formation on the left is mm -hmm. in your mind, you're visualizing this mentally. It's not actually copying an actual rock formation in nature. Is that correct? Yes, you're right. Okay. All right, well, let's, let's move on to two other of your works. Okay, these are also the freestyle. And the left one, I depict a winter scene. That's why I, I kind of painted the sky gray to, in order to let the white mountain to stand out. And you can see in the front is all the very bottom. Uh, I still left the, the space white to represent the waterfall. The water is, is flowing down and then I just use a tiny bit of uh, brown color and green to, rep to, to paint, to apply the color on the tree. And then on some of the tree on the, on the left hand side, you can see that I left it white. So it depicts that there was snow on the, on the vegetation. And then on the right hand side, uh, I tried to depict the majestic mountain, like the mountain is so great. So I purposely kind of like moved the roofs kind of like to the bottom and then just to show the big mountain with the clouds, uh, the misty, misty mountain. Mm. So when do you decide to use color and as opposed to just black and white? Um, it just depends on your feeling, how you feel. <laughs> okay. And, and certain painting, you want to leave it black and white and it, it looks good. So you don't need any color. You don't need to add any color. Okay, well, let's, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, this is, uh, um, you can see the human figure is a Gongbi star, the meticulous star. You can see many, many lines. And then I think we'll see another one, the flower and the, the birds, right, Tom? Yes, yes. Okay, that is another very good example. Okay, um, the gongbi is uh, meticulously do the outline and then I fill in the color. And actually this is kind of like meticulous and freestyle mix. Even the pine is not 100% meticulous. But later, when you see the, the bird, you, you'll see exactly the 100% meticulous style. And in Chinese, it's called the gong bi. Gong means like you are very careful, very meticulous. Bi means brush. Now, Ken, the trunk of the tree looks a bit exaggerated. Is this part of that expressionist? Yes, exactly. Yes. And I, I purpose, yes, I exaggerate it to make it look like an old pine. <laughs> Okay, and I see three seals in this, one in the lower right-hand corner, mm -hmm. two under the calligraphy on the left side. Why, okay. why three seals? Okay, um, on the left, you see two seals. Um, that is my name, okay? Uh, usually, we want to use a pair. And for the seals, uh, the writing could be white or red. Uh, if we have some bigger thing, we can maybe you can find um, 
one, one slide to show that. And usually we put the, if the seal, the writing in the seal is white, we call it the yin because you have carved it into the stone. So when you stamp the seal, it shows the background red and the writing, the, the supposedly the brush stroke is white, the line mm. is white. And that is called a yin script. And okay. if you have the stone and lift a line to show the character, that is called a yang script. And because of the yin yang philosophy in Chinese, you want to put the, the white script on the top. The yin is on the top because in the Chinese, we always say yin yang. We never say yang yin. <laughs> so the yin is on the top. And the yang script is at the bottom. And okay. you ask me why the three seals, okay. Uh, the one on the right hand corner, uh, the Chinese call it the ya jiao zhang, something to stable the corner of the painting. Because if you look at this whole painting, the kind of like the top right hand side and the bottom is all blank and white. And we try to break out the white part. So we put a red seal on. And mm -hmm. for this seal, usually it's bigger than my name. That's why you see this one is much bigger than the two under my name. The, uh, the choreography on the left uh, that I wrote down is uh, a scholar trying to write something under a pine tree and then put down the date. The, the year and the month and then my name. And okay. for the seal on the right hand side is a verse from a poem of some famous line that I like. <laughs> All right. Let's move on and two others. Okay. These are also the freestyle. Uh, as you can see, the on the left is a landscape. Um, this one was painted in like early 80s maybe 81, 82. And then uh, on the right hand side, you see the lotus. And you can see the lotus leaves, the two on the top, just ink. And because they are very bold and dark, so I, I want to leave it like that. So I didn't add any color on it. And then uh, the, the leaves kind of like towards the bottom, I just put some blue and green on it. And it's just to express my idea. You don't see a real lotus flower like this. All right, are we ready to move on? Next one. No. Okay. Okay, this one is painted on the paper that I cut out imitating the Chinese fan. And this is the style of a the style of a Song painting. If you divide the fan diagonally from the top left down to the bottom right, you can see it can be divided in two equal halves, almost. Not exactly, right? And I was just painted on the the left hand, lower left hand corner. And that is usually how the Song painter painted. Um, that's why the, some scholar joking say, uh, in the, during the Southern Song, they just paint on the corner. That's why they lost the land in the Northern China. Okay. Okay, um, this is the two more freestyle. Uh, I do more freestyle because it's kind of like more way easier to express myself instead of the meticul meticulous style. The meticulous scumpy style takes much longer to paint because you have to do the outline very carefully and then fill in the color uh, layer by layer. Usually my color, uh, I don't apply the color only one layer. I, I usually put one layer, let it dry, or I use a blow dryer to dry it, and I apply second layer, and usually it's at least three, three layers at least.
three to five layers. Sometimes even if it's not thick enough, I will put six layers. And the reason to do this is the result would come out different. If you mix a color real thick and apply one, one layer compared to the five layers. The, if you use five layers, the color looks more subtle, more toned down. And the uh, left-hand side, again, is a scholar by the pine tree. And you, because in Chinese uh, culture, pine represents longevity. And, and then the pine needle supposedly has some, um, uh, you can use it as medicine too. So the Chinese scholar love pine trees. So usually we we'll paint the scholar with a pine tree. And of course, uh, for the symbol of longevity, besides the pine tree is the crane, uh, the one with the red on the head. Uh, yeah, the pine, the crane. And I think there's one more thing. I can't think right now. <laughs> yes. I can. So you visualize this whole scene in your mind before you make the first brush stroke. Yes. Yes. I visualize everything first. Okay. And I don't make any sketches. I just go ahead and paint on the paper. <laughs> All right. Now, here's a colorful one. Okay. Yeah. This is another one um, kind of mixed meticulous style and the freestyle. As you can see, the lotus flower is the you can see the gold line that is the uh, part of the meticulous star and then the dragonfly too if you look at the actual painting you can see a little little line the fine line to depict the wings of the uh, dragonfly this one was painted in 1993 and uh, this lotus with the gold line is the star of a tang dynasty and you can still see this kind of painting in the Tunghuang Caves in the western part of China. Uh, because of during the Tang Dynasty, the Silk Road, many merchants came from the Middle Eastern country and they brought the foreign cultures and they influenced the Chinese painting too. That's yeah. why earlier, excuse me. So earlier yeah. in the Depot's poem, it says that. I would go into a bar operated by a foreign young lady. <laughs> okay, Ken, I've traveled all extensively in China mm -hmm. and I've seen hundreds of lotus ponds, lotus uh, yes. in flower, uh, but they're uh, always pink, a yes. lighter pink. These are deep red. Why, why are they so dark? I just exaggerated. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. Yeah, I never part seen of that. Never seen any red lotus like this so red. So <laughs> part of that wanted, expression, expressing yeah. yourself. Yeah, part of the expression. I just wanted to stand out real strong. That's why I painted it <laughs> with the gold line. <laughs> Let your emotions out. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's go to the last uh, picture that we're going to talk okay. about. Yeah, one of my favorites. Is, yes, this is the one that I mentioned earlier, the bird. I say that this is a 100% meticulous star. You can see it. Uh, by painting this bird, it took me three hours. I outlined it. Uh, first, I did a, a very light sketch with pencil on the paper, real light, because the, the paper is very tender. And then after I finished the sketches, I use a real fine brush to go to outline it and then I fill in the, the color. And like this one, you see two seals too. Um, the one on the right is not my name. It says under the lamp because I painted this in the evening. So the seal says under the lamp. And <laughs> this is the example of the white script, the yin script. Okay, now Ken, I noticed there's nothing in the background. It's just white or blank space, negative space. Mm -hmm. it, this is typical of Chinese paint style painting. Yes, you're right. They're, because they just pay attention to the main object and they don't want to paint the 
the background. That's why we just leave the main object to stand out like this. And okay. of course, it's also the Taoist inference. You want yeah. the, the white, the blank. House. Okay. okay. Well, uh, you know, I think we can tell from this that Ken is definitely a modern Chinese scholar specializing in traditional styles and blending Chinese and Western styles together. Ken, I want to thank you for participating in this and helping us with us. We're going to give you a chance to talk further in just a minute. And also any of our viewers want to ask questions uh, of you about your painting or ch styles. Uh, we'll be glad to have them and we can continue this discussion. But before we get to that, I just want to hope wish all the members of our Southern Breeze Tree and Stone Society to have a happy and safe holiday season and good health. It should be good health, not good healthy. And peace to you, your family members throughout the coming year. Well, now I'm going to end this, uh, stop sharing this. And Ken, if you wanna say anything or if we can open it up to questions uh, for you, we can, we can do that. Ken, do you wanna start off and then if someone has a question, just uh, uh, speak up. Okay, earlier I, I saw a, a few questions on the chat and I did not remember all the questions. And uh, I just remember the very last one about hanging the brushes. Okay, the reason that you see in the, one of the slides that I have some brushes hanging on the stand, the reason that I hang a brush is uh, Every time I finish painting, I would wash my brush real good. And when I finish washing the brushes, I would um, hang it to let it air dry. That's why you see the brushes is hanging on a stand, not in a container. Okay, and I couldn't remember the other questions and whoever asked a question, maybe please. Yeah bring it up again and I try my best to answer the questions. Okay. Yes, Rick, your speaker's off. Thank you. I just want to say that what a delightful uh, gathering this has been. I really have enjoyed it. Uh, I have a great fondness for the concept of uh, being a scholar poet uh, living in your private space. And uh, it's a true pleasure to hear other people who have uh, uh, this concept in mind and have uh, so many things to contribute. Thank you so much, Ken, for the presentation. Very, very, very well. excellent. You're very I do well. have one question, and it is about uh, the uh, nature of your ink and your pigments. Uh, I do a lot of watercolor painting myself, Western watercolor painting, but... Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the physical chemistry of, your, of the ink? Is it soot mixed with glue? Uh, and the physical chemistry uh, and the nature of the colored pigments that you use? That would be very interesting to me. Thank you. No, you're